I'd like to, to make some remarks about a, uh, a video that I watched here recently uh, by Matthew S. McCormick. Uh, and I wrote down some notes, so I'll be looking at my notes to make sure that I stay on track here. But uh, McCormick is a professor, uh, uh, assistant professor, I think, of philosophy at California State University in Sacramento. And uh, he also wrote a book, and this is how I came in, into contact with him. I was in a bookstore here recently, and I saw a book called Atheism and the Case Against Christ, uh, written by McCormick. And so I, uh, I did buy the book, and I haven't read all of the book. I've read some of it, and I hope in the, in the near future to make some responses to the line of argument in the book. It's kind of a detailed line of argument, and I don't want to make comments about it before finishing his book. Uh, but I, I sort of know how I want to go in response to it. But, uh, but he did, I looked at his website, and he has uh, a number of different videos and articles that he's made uh, supporting and arguing for his atheism and attacking various defenses of Christianity. And I watched one of them. I read several of the articles uh, just to kind of get a sense of where he's coming from. And then I listened to a couple of his videos. He had a couple of videos critiquing the Kalam cosmological argument. Uh, especially as promoted by William Lane Craig. Uh, I don't usually defend the Kalam uh, cosmological argument, uh, first of all, because really my training, my background, my, my own convictions lean not so much in the direction of the Kalam argument, but more in the uh, you know, Aquinas' version of the cosmological argument, which is not quite the same thing as the Kalam uh, argument. Uh, the Kalam argument, just to, to state what the difference is, uh, pretty much sees the uh, uh, that uh, you know the uh, possibility of there being an infinite number of events preceding the present moment is impossible. Therefore, there must be a first reality in the past. So there must have been a first reality that then was the cause of the uh, series of events that culminate with this moment or that, uh, that are continuing past this moment, of course. But there must have been a finite number of events that preceded this moment. And that suggests that there must be a first, an absolutely first cause, historically speaking. Now, I think that uh, I have a great sympathy for that argument, and I think that it, uh, uh, there's something very compelling about it. Uh, however, uh, the approach that I've taken to the cosmological argument has been much more formed by uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, who doesn't so much argue for uh, an impossibility of an infinite series into the past, uh, but rather he argues for the impossibility of an infinite number of present hierarch or hierarchically structured uh, causes. Uh, so in other words, uh, for me to say the words that are coming out of my mouth now, there can't be an infinite number of things that have to happen right now in order for me to say these words. We're talking about right now, not into the past. For Aquinas, if there have been an infinite number of things that have happened in the past, that's irrelevant to the sustaining or the causal relationships for a present event. Uh, so for example, if I'm holding a piece of paper in my hand right now, uh, that's different than uh, the company that produced this paper. The company that produced this paper could have gone out of existence uh, yesterday. It could have been blown up or, or destroyed. Uh, the company, that this paper here, does not require the ongoing going existence of that company. Uh, but the paper being held up right now requires the simultaneous influence of my hand on the paper. That's simultaneous causality. Now, in order for my hand to be holding up the paper, though, there's also some things that need to be going on inside of me. If there were no m skeletal and muscular and nervous uh, causal interactions going on right now, my hand would not be able to hold up this paper uh, either. My hand would fall down or whatever. And so there are all kinds of causal interactions going on simultaneously at this moment in order for me to hold up this piece of paper. But can the number of simultaneously uh, uh, upholding causal relationships right now, can that be infinite in number? Like someone used the example of a person standing on, a, on the uh, deck of a ship. If I'm standing on the deck of a ship holding up an anchor, uh, so the anchor is being held up because I'm holding it up, but I'm being held up because the boat is holding me up, but the boat is being held up because the water is holding it up, but the water is being held up because of the surface of the planet, and the, the surface of the planet is being held up because of the core or whatever, and that's being held up because of its relationship to the gravitational relationship to the sun or whatever. But you can't have an infinite number of things holding the others up, kind of like the endless series of turtles, you know, everyone holding up the other one, and you have an infinite number of things holding up the other right now. 
not into the past, but right at this present moment. So that's kind of how the, uh, uh, I've kind of, in my own experience, defended the cosmological argument is in terms of present causal relationships, not into the past. The, uh, the Kalam argument is more focused on going into the past. Now, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, quibble too much about that because I don't think that any of McCormick's criticisms of the Kalam argument actually work, first of all. Uh, and secondly, uh, I think that most of them actually apply also to the version of the cosmologic argument that I'm more in favor of defending. Uh, and I think that his criticisms of William Lane Craig and his approach to this argument are, uh, are not good criticisms. And so what I thought I would do here is uh, offer some responses to the main arguments that he gave on his website, on the video that he made on this subject, and, uh, and throw them out there for your consideration. First of all, when I read through his uh, various objections, it, 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 to be fair, he spends his first video explaining the cosmological argument according to William Lane Craig. And, um, and I think he does a, a, a fair job of, of presenting the, the working of the argument. So if you, if you go through the first video, I think you'll find uh, a decent presentation of the argument. In his second video, it's approximately 20 minutes long, uh, he offers his objections to it. Uh, so let me just throw them out to you. Of course, you, you recall the argument, I suppose. Uh, if you don't, I'll just relate it. Uh, essentially, the way the Kalam argument goes is that, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, every event uh, has to have uh, uh, a prior cause. Um, there can't be an infinite number of events going uh, into the past. An actual infinite number of events in the past is impossible. Therefore, there must be a first uncaused source of the various effects or events that have happened. So with that basic structure in mind, um, the objections that McCormick throws out are, first of all, that uh, the, uh, the claim that the universe could not have come from nothing is uh, objectionable. In other words, um, McCormick actually suggests that it is defensible that we think of the universe as coming from nothing. Now, this is quite a remarkable uh, claim that the universe could have come from nothing because to my mind, and, and I'm happy to hear any criticism of this, to my mind, that is uh, absolute absurdity to say that the universe, indeed we should take it seriously, that the universe came from nothing is to show how desperate the atheist position is to avoid the conclusion of the existence of God. Uh, if we really are going to take seriously the, a universe from absolute nothing, nothing as being defined classically in this discussion is the absence of being altogether. If this universe came from absolute nothingness, then there is no explanation of the reality of our world. In other words, if I accept the claim that this universe is grounded in and came from absolute nothing, non-being altogether, then the, the rational quest for an explanation of the world, the operating principle of the human intellect, that when there is an event, there is a reason for that event, that the world around us is reasonable, that it makes sense, has now come to its end. This claim that the universe came from nothing is the death of reason. It's the death of a reasonable universe. It's the denial of reason and a rational world around us. I hope you see why. Because if nothing can be the explanation of something, then any quest for ultimate explanation is intellectual suicide. It's the death of the intellect. If the intellect can be satisfied at the end of our questioning with a total absence of being altogether, and that it's that total absence of being, which cannot be a reason, total absence of being cannot be a reason for anything because it's nothing. And so if a person accepts the total absence of being and therefore the total absence of reason as an explanation for this world and for the universe, 
uh, then to me that shows only the desperate attempt to avoid the reality of the existence of God based upon the world around us. If, however, nothing is not a satisfying explanation, which I don't see how it can be a satisfying explanation to the intellect, if it can't be a satisfying explanation to the intellect, then we must continue our quest for what would account for the source and origin of the world that we experience. Now, uh, McCormick doesn't spend too much time on this particular objection. He simply cites uh, Lawrence Krauss's book, Universe from Nothing, question mark, uh, and says, go read that. He's a smart guy, and he actually defends that position based upon, uh, you know, quantum events coming to exist out of nothing and so on. But as many have already pointed out, and I remember picking up Krauss's book, you know, Universe from Nothing, I remember picking it up and looking through it and reading maybe 30, 40 pages or so in a bookstore. I was flipping through it and reading it, and I was looking to see at what point is he actually going to assert that a universe from absolutely nothing is a defensible position, because I wanted to see how he was going to argue that, because it's just fundamentally absurd to say that nothing can explain the origin of everything is to me absolutely de devoid of content, because nothing is nothing. It can't explain anything because it's nothing. And so I finally get to the crucial point in his book where he's addressing this question, and he basically goes on to say that nothing, as he's defining it, is actually something. He says, nobody can really mean by nothing the total absence of being. What they mean is a void, and he goes on to describe a void as a, as a, a quantum field or a, a quantum uh, fluctuation of some sort out of which comes to be the Big Bang. But that's a totally different scenario than the nothing that we're traditionally talking about in the context of the cosmological argument. Uh, that's not a real nothing, that's, uh, that's a quantum vacuum or, or whatever, a series of quantum events uh, that produce this. But that's something, that's a substrate, that's a source of this uh, activity or the origin of matter, not total nothingness. And of course at that point we have to question about the origins of that uh, energy and, and that drives us to other questions that resemble the same kinds of questions that we were asking about the cosmological argument itself. So what, uh, what uh, Krauss does in his book is classic equivocation. He changes the meaning of the word nothing uh, and then proceeds on that uh, basis. So that's the first objection that, uh, that uh, McCormick gives, uh, and I, I find that one quite revealing. It, it's almost an appeal to anything uh, to avoid the conclusions of the cosmological argument. I'm going to stop now on this and I'll, I'll return for a second presentation focusing on a second uh, collection of responses to the Kalam argument. This one will be, uh, will focus on uh, uh, McCormick's claim that the cosmological argument, whatever it's worth, simply does not establish the various attributes of God, uh, and in particular he has omnipotence, omniscience, uh, infinite goodness, personal consciousness, and infinity. Uh, actually, the infinite part is, a, is an additional argument, but uh, those are the things that he brings up, uh, and I'd like to address uh, those in my next presentation.